Hi, Liz. Hi, Maggie. How are you? I'm great. Welcome to Launch Rural Nevada. We're about to start our education sessions. Excellent. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so grateful that you're here too. We worked together on getting this deck together and we've made it pretty simple and straightforward for a first time founder. And if it's okay with you, I'll just start sharing my screen and we'll jump. Absolutely. Right Let's just jump right in. I agree. All right. Welcome to session one. We're going to talk about validating your idea. And so you have an idea, now what happens? But first, let's talk about why we're doing this. We have conducted the Rural Nevada Pitch Day for, um, this will be our third year. And we're very excited that last year we added a kids track. And so the kids are eligible for the same prizes as the adults are. We are looking for, for second, third place. We also have an audience choice award. And the big day is happening on November 4th. So we're doing this lead-in education to help founders who may not have had any sort of formal introduction to how should, they should be thinking about their business. We want to increase awareness among the rurals that there is support for entrepreneurs in Nevada. And we want to just offer general education. And we want to really connect with the rural areas and make it easier for them to reach out to the more metropolitan areas and access some of these assets that we have available for them. So for the pitch competition, we just ask that the applicants be Nevada residents and they should be a rural resident and that can their business can be in a rural location or they can live in a rural location and that is pretty much all of the state except for the Las Vegas MSA so that includes Henderson, Summerlin, all the area north Las Vegas that are really part of the metro area. Uh, when you get down to Boulder that's definitely rural and up in the Reno area the it's the Reno city area. It does not actually include Carson. Carson City is considered rural. So um, large, large portions of the state are rural. And so you may be eligible. Sparks is part of Reno. It's Reno Sparks. Correct. Sparks is part of the metro area. Um, but when you get to, give me a city that's north of here. Winnemucca is definitely rural. Uh, what's the next set, kind of city you come to on 80? And then there's portions of very far north. Fernley, that's that's rural, but there's stuff before Fernley. You know if you live in Reno or the Las Vegas metropolitan area. If you don't, you're good. Right. Yes, that's true. And the application date is October 14th. Uh, in the emails that you're getting, uh, you will find the links to the application and also the link to our website, which is launchruralnevada.com, which has all of the details, the pitch guidelines are there, and the prize money will be there. Currently, uh, we have a certain amount for prizes, but we are recruiting more sponsors so that we can increase our prize level. When we come to actual pitch day on November 4th, there will be live locations around the state, and all of our education sessions will be recorded. And we're also offering live office hours. So after we cover a topic, if you have any questions, usually within a week, there will be a live office hours. And these will be shared with you in email to join. And you can have Liz and me answering your questions if you need any help with anything. You can also send an email at any time to ruralnevadapitchday at gmail.com. Okay, the live pitch, uh, I should put the date on here. It's, we do have tickets for the in-person okay. event so we can plan for food, November 4th. Okay, so here's the thing. Maggie and I spend a lot of time helping entrepreneurs and founders start new businesses. And it's really important to understand that, that it's not easy, but it's a tremendous amount of fun, right? But it is not easy. In fact, one of my jokes that I tell people is, is sort of one of the things I say, and they're like, oh my gosh, you're an entrepreneur. That's so exciting. You know, and I, and they're like, you get to work whenever you want. And I'm like, yeah, I work. I only work half time and I get to choose which 12 hours a day it is. <laughs> right? And, and this is, this is the life of an entrepreneur. So understand it is a tremendous amount of fun. It is very exciting, but it's a lot of work and it requires a very positive mental attitude. I often talk to people about 
you know, you can talk about all the problems that you have, or you can climb mountains and kill dragons and, you know, fight off the, the bad guys, or you can just be bummed out about the problems. Because when you're having an, a, a, when you're a founder of an, or you're an entrepreneur, there's a lot of problems, but your attitude makes all the difference. You have to be creative. You cannot solve new problems in old ways. You always have to be thinking about being creative about everything that comes your way. Um, critical thinking and problem solving. Like I said, there are lots of problems. So thinking it through, being thoughtful about it, having, you know, problem solving. If this is the parameters, what are our options? And really thinking through how you can possibly solve it. You've got to be good at talking to people because you're going to have to tell your story. You're going to have to tell your story to people who want to buy from you. You're going to have to tell your story to people who want to work from you. You're going to have to tell your story to people you want to invest in you. You've got to be able to communicate clearly. You have to be self-motivated. Nobody's telling you what to do. You get up in the morning, you sit down at your desk or do whatever it is you're doing because nobody's going to tell you what to do. And tenacity and the ability to learn from failure. You know, you just can't let the failures get you down. You can't let the mistakes drive you. You have to go, okay, here's what I learned. Next thing. Good entrepreneurs make lots of mistakes and then they fix them and they learn from them and they don't do them again. Flexibility and adaptability. Like I said, I choose which 12 hours a day I work. I work when work needs to be done. I am doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And I can't think that I'm going to do this at this time and this at this time. I set up my calendar and the world happens. We have to be adaptable to whatever the situation is. And we have to have people that we can trust and collaborate with. Because even though it's your business and you have to be self-driven and all of those things, you still need people you trust. Because when we're only in our own head, we don't have good outside understanding of what's going on. So we always want to find people to collaborate with. You have an idea. Very cool. Now what? what? What do we do? I have an idea. I want to do something. Let's talk about how do you get from idea to business? And so the first thing is you have to test the idea. I have this idea. I, I want to create this crayon that melts in water. I don't know, some crazy thing that I have. Now I have to go, okay, is this something people would want? Do they want this? Or is this just something I think would be really cool? And the second thing is, who would want what I'm doing and what I'm making, what I'm creating or building? And how would I reach those people to find out if, in fact, they would be interested or would want this or this would solve a problem for them? And then the third thing is to figure out, okay, people want it. I think it's a cool idea. I figured out how to make it work, but can I make money? Is this a business or is it a hobby? Is it an idea? Is it something fun? And if you want a business, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Am I still doing this? Yes. <laughs> We're going to go back and forth, you guys. So testing the idea. So the first thing is I get the idea. And then before you go building this thing that could be very expensive to build, you might want to build what we call a prototype which is, it could be just a, a drawing. It could just be a, something made of clay, whatever it is. So you're making, this is what I think it's going to be. Now, if it's a computer thing and there's not a physical thing, then you maybe need to have a map, just like you would map a, um, a website. So you need something that that's the beginning design of the product. And then we need to build a business model. I think I'm going to sell this product to these kinds of people and um, I think they're going to use it to solve this problem. And then once we get through all of that, we can start to create a prototype and validate the dollar ideas. A prototype is a little bit further along, which is really your first attempt at, at creating the real thing. So once we go through this process, we're going to have to make a decision, right? We're going to talk to customers. We're going to understand whether they're interested, whether they would buy it how much they would spend on it, whether or not there's a business model that can work. And then I'm going to decide I'm going to punt, which we call punting is actually I'm throwing this in the trash and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to pivot. Oh, I thought these people would need it, but really these people need it. So I need to do it a little differently that helps these people and proceed is I have a good idea. The people I think want it, want it. It works the way it should work. I'm proceeding. So that's the process we're going to go through. And Maggie's going to tell us about how we're going to test the idea with customers. Yeah. So once you have this process in place, it does not mean that that's the end of your work. You're going to continue to talk to your customers. So this is really just testing the idea before you've invested a ton of time or a ton of money into it. 
And when you're testing your idea, you can't talk to family and you can't talk to your friends because they love you and they want to support you and they want to say it's a great idea. So what you need to do is find people who don't know you and talk to them. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to understand if the problem that you've identified is one that they've also experienced. Have they had that same situation? And how painful is it for them? Is it a paper cut or is it a gushing artery? As founders, you wanna be solving gushing artery problems, but you also kind of hope that most of those problems have already been solved. So we need to find something in between that is a serious problem that you have the expertise to solve. How painful is it for them? Does it take a lot of their time? Is it a very complex problem that they just can't deal with? Does it cost a lot? Does it cause constant frustration? If you can resolve somebody's frustration, then it's very likely you have a product that people will buy. And you want to find out how they're currently solving the problem now. When Henry Ford developed the motor car, people were riding horses. So people, you know, when they say, well, there is no competition because there's no other cars, but there is competition because people were solving the transportation problem by using horses. So there is always competition. It's just, you may have a more efficient way of resolving it. So we wanna determine if you have a market, if to confirm there's a need, you have to observe the reaction of the potential customer and you want to get suggestions on improving the idea. And this is also not a one-time only thing. This is something that you wanna be talking to your customers about. Even after you have your product in the marketplace, you wanna be continually improving it. The best way to do that is to talk to your customers. And then you need to know the level of enthusiasm that your customer has for your product. Like I said, right, is it something that they're going to spontaneously tell their neighbors about because it solves the problem in such a great way? Or is it something that they would buy maybe twice a year? So this really is going to help you gauge how much of a market you have and how great a product you have. And while you're talking to your customers, potential customers, you may actually get them to agree to help you test it. How do we conduct customer research? We're gonna develop a questionnaire first to understand the problem. And then we're gonna develop a different questionnaire to test the solution. So it's really key that we understand the nature of the problem before we start talking about the solution. It's very easy to lead somebody you don't know down a path by talking about the solution. You need to understand the problem first before you talk about your solution. And then we wanna summarize everything that we learn so that we can draw conclusions. We're going to create this questionnaire about the problem. And one way that you would do it is you would go to, it used to be you could go to a mall. I don't know where you find people now. Right now it's Hot August Nights. So coffee shop, coffee shop, Hot August Nights. Coffee shop, right. A restaurant that gets busy where people are waiting, that is a good place to go and talk to people. And so you just want to say, hey, I'm conducting some research here. Do you have a few minutes? And then you will have developed your questions. And the questions should follow in this order. Have you experienced this problem? Do you consider it a problem? Is it a problem for you? What are you doing right now to deal with this problem? How often do you have the problem or do you experience it? And are you satisfied with the way that you are solving the problem right now? Would you like an easier solution? On a scale to one to 10, how interested are you in something that would make that problem easier to deal with? Do you have friends and family, other people you know who experience this problem? Okay, and so it's, you don't wanna rush through your questionnaire as you're doing it. You really want them to talk. And the more that they talk to you about the problem or like their neighbor, Joe, that has this problem and this is what he does, you should be taking notes. This is all really valuable information. So how many people do you know that have this problem? How long do you have to wait for the current solution to work? Would a faster solution make you happier? And how much time are you willing to invest in learning this solution? If there is, oh, a software application and you have to learn how to use it in order to solve your problem, but it's like a one-time investment of time and then you're 
problem gets solved really quickly, are you willing to do that? How much time would you be willing to spend to do that? Are you willing to pay for a better solution? Like, does it cause you enough pain that you would actually pay money to have this solution? If so, how much are you willing to pay? And how often do you think you would be buying that solution? If it's a one-time deal, if it's a subscription, if it's something you have to buy, you know, every three months you have to buy a new thing that's gonna clean your toilet, like whatever it is. So you wanna learn about frequency too. So that's how we're gonna learn about the problem. And then you can describe your solution, your aha moment, you have this idea, if you were able to build a prototype or a prototype, that's when you can show it to them. And then you're going to ask questions about this potential solution. So you've described it, you've shown it to them, and then you need to ask them, do you think that this would solve the problem? Why or why not? And this is where you're going to get really extremely valuable feedback on how you could improve it. What else do you think it should do? Should it do more stuff or should it just stick to the job at hand? How would you change it? Would you make it sleeker? Would you make it a different color? Would you change the size of it? Anything that they can tell you about how it would be more valuable for them. And then you can ask them if they think others would like the solution. How many? Do you think that you would be willing to pay for this solution? If yes, how much? What would you be willing to pay? And this is kind of when you learn whether the problem is a paper cut solution, which is something that's a little bit annoying, but definitely livable, versus something that causes a lot of frustration and it would save an hour of your day if you were able to solve this problem. This is how you engage how valuable your solution is. Ask them what they would pay, how often they would buy it. And if they are very enthusiastic, you can ask them if they would be interested in being an early tester. If they would go on this journey with you as a user, that you could look at the thing in its first iteration, make suggestions, and then, you know, a lot of people really appreciate the fact that you listen to them and you incorporate their ideas to make the product better. So if it's not the solution for you, do you think it solves the problem for someone else? Like, who do you think that would be? Why would they like the solution and it's not really right for you? And then if it is a solution that you like, where would you expect to be able to find this? This is gonna help you to understand where to market the product. Is it something that should be available online? Should it be at the local grocery store? Should it be at a drugstore? Where would they expect to find the solution to this problem? Then you're gonna have a lot of work to do when you look at all of your answers and try to draw conclusions from it. The conclusions you wanna draw, what did people like about the idea in its current state? What ideas did they have for improving it? And did you get a number of people who were willing to use the idea, your solution? Were they willing to pay for it? What was the balance of people who liked it versus those who didn't? And then any comments that they made that were something you said, oh, I have to remember that for the future. I have to either incorporate it or I have to remember that they thought that this solution was good for this type of person. I need to go see if I can find that type of person and ask them if they really are the person who would use the solution. From this, Liz is gonna tell you how to create a value proposition. So before we start on value proposition, I wanna point out clearly that Maggie started this discussion with the customer's problem, trying to understand if the customer has a problem and how they feel about the problem. We did not start with the product. We started with the problem. And then Maggie gave you a list of questions you could ask to say, would this product be useful to you? Would this help you solve the problem? So the order that you do that in is really important because this is the order you're going to keep for the rest of the time that you're working on and working on this and selling this. And what I like to say is when you're talking about your product, you don't want people to go, hmm, yeah, tell me more. You want people to go, oh, can you do that for me? Oh my goodness, can you fix that? You can, you, oh my gosh, I can't believe you can do that. 
That's so cool. That would save me so much time. That would be so cool. I would love that. Oh my gosh, my mom would be so happy. Like that's the kind of response you want. And you'll never get that if you're talking about your product. You will only get that if you're talking about the problem. And they can have that reaction before they even know what your product is. So remember that the problem is the critical part here. So we're going to talk about value proposition. And this is kind of how you tell your story, how you talk to people about your product or your solution. A value proposition describes the problem, describes a problem and or need that you're addressing and the benefits your customers can expect from your product and service. Now, I want to just say, back up just a little bit, because it is possible that you're creating something that doesn't solve a problem. Um, but then it fills a desire or a want. So sometimes you're like, well, this is not really a real problem here. Okay, well, then what does it do for them? Is it really fun? Is it really exciting? Does it make them feel great? Think about it in those terms. If there's not a, a proper problem, like my grass is dying because my sprinklers never work, you know, that would be a real problem unless I rip the grass out, but that's another story. Okay, so starting with the customer's problem, but not just the customer's problem, you did all this research, so you can, do, you can talk about the customer's problem in their own words. Do not talk about the customer's problems in your words because they won't relate. They won't relate unless you're using their words, and then they will relate and get excited. You need to then tell them how you solve it. I solve this, so okay, so Liz, your grass is dead. I can fix this. <gasps> really? You can fix my dead grass? That's so exciting. How? Well, I have this really cool new sprinkler system that does all these really cool things. Um, and it's especially designed for homeowners like you that have small properties and don't like worrying about fixing things. This never will have to be fixed once it's put in. And it's really good for people like you who don't like to do the work themselves and have a hard time finding a handyman to do it. <gasps> I'm so excited now because you just told me how you were going to solve my problem instead of telling me, hey, if you started with, hey, Liz, I have this really cool new sprinkler system, be like, yeah, I know, I've talked to, I've done that a million times, uh, you know, you wouldn't have my attention, but you start with, Liz, I can fix your dead grass problem. And I say that to you because my grass is actually dying out front and I need the new sprinkler system. But anyway, that's how we talk about value proposition. And it, and it should get people excited. If it doesn't, you don't have the right story or you don't have, you're not solving the right problem or you're not solving it in a way that people can understand. I get so excited about these things. We talked earlier about what's kind of the process for, for telling people, for figuring out whether people want this. And so we started with figure out the problem. How would you solve it? And this is a really interesting thing called a Palm Pilot which I am sure most of you, if not all of you have never heard of, but I will tell you, I had one. This is a, this is a prototype for a Palm Pilot. And it's really just a cardboard with a drawing on the front, okay? So somebody came up with this idea. What if you could manage your appointments on a device? And, and for me, the big thing was, and it actually beeps when you're late. That was my problem because my paper calendar never beeped when I was late. So somebody walked up to me and said, look, Liz, I have this really cool, I understand you are always late for your appointments because you're always late for appointments with me. So I, I have this way that it will beep when you're late for your appointment. Do you want to see this? Yes. Now he shows me. I'm like, well, that kind of looks cool. All right. Yeah, I could see how that would work. Okay. So then after the prototype and we kind of talk about the idea, then we do the next step, which is we would do a prototype where we would get closer to something that looks like this. And then we would have an actual finished product. And I'm telling you, I had one of these. It saved my life. So I carried around my little Palm Pilot and I put my little appointments in and my address book and voila, I was not late for appointments and I had everybody's phone number. This was the coolest thing in the world. And you guys are all sitting there going, what? That's the coolest thing in the world because now we have, you ready for the next one? Well, uh, we have cell phones. We have smartphones that do all this stuff for us. But before we had these kind of smartphones, we had what this thing over here is called a BlackBerry. Now, this was a super cool thing because it gave me actually a typewriter kind of thing that I could write on and I could use it as a phone and I could still have all my Palm Pilot information in there. So I, I actually had one of these two. That's how old I am. I had a Palm Pilot and then I had a BlackBerry and then... <gasps> 
I got my iPhone. Now, if you had started with an iPhone in the very beginning, I would have been like, what? Does what? I couldn't have even comprehended it, but we evolved from that Palm Pilot into this idea. And that's what happens. So you get your prototype, then you create your prototype, then you create your product. Now, where that goes from there, one never knows. But this is, this is how market evolution works. We did not have a picture where we could show an early version of the Palm Pilot. So from the cardboard going to maybe a wood block or the first inner workings without the case on it to the, that was the final product. That was the one that Liz actually owned. And it was one of the first electronic devices that you could carry with you. So imagine like it would take just, you know, a snap of the fingers worth of processing power now for that. Oh, so it was pretty big back when it was created. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's interesting again, and remember that they didn't come to me and say, Liz, I have this really cool device and it's electronic and it does all these cool things. They said, Liz, do you never wanna miss an appointment again? Because it beeps at you when you're supposed to be going to your appointment or when you're late, right? Start with my problem and then they created a solution. And that's how you wanna be thinking about how you're talking about things. And that's the process for developing. Okay, homework, is this you or me, Maggie? Go ahead. Okay, so now we're challenging you to go out and do this work. This is your challenge. Don't think of it as homework. I would call it a challenge. Your challenge is to create a customer survey. So think about your, your idea and then think about what problem does it solve and create questions. And that we have some really good questions to help you that you already read. And think about those questions that you would ask and then go ask people. So think about your, their problem first and then think about your product. So first ask, write the questions about the problem and then the questions about the product and then go out and talk to 25 people that are not friends or family. You can also talk to friends and family, but they don't count in your 25. And by the way, not only do your parents love you and will tell you what you're doing is great, you might have parents like mine who said, that's a dumb idea when I created an idea that would have been a million dollar idea. So don't, don't count on just the people that love you. Go and find people who actually might have this problem or interest. So once you do that, then you're going to summarize your results and you're going to create a value proposition based on that information. And remember, it's going to be their problem in their words, how you solve it and why you're the best for your ideal customer, for the people that you're talking to. Um, and you're going to make them go, oh, can you do that for me? And the moment you have somebody say that, you know you've got a real value proposition. So good luck on your, on your challenge, you guys. I can't wait to hear how it goes. So good luck. We are going to have office hours next Tuesday. That's August 9th. And uh, the link will be sent out in an email. And it runs from 12 to 1. And you'll have Liz and me to help you with your questions if you need help framing those questions. Or if you've already done some surveys and you want to talk about how it's going, we can do that. Or if you need help summarizing your idea, we're happy to do that too. So that will be Tuesday, August 9th from noon until one. It's just a free drop-in Zoom session. So welcome and good luck on the rest of this journey. And we're gonna do great things together. We can't wait to get your applications in the mail for Pitch Day, which is November 4th. Thanks. Thanks everybody, good luck.